Part the Third, Euphorbia, Section Three, of Thais by Anatole France. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Euphorbia, Section Three. When he reopened his eyes, he saw around him monks wearing black hoods who poured water on his temples and recited exorcisms. Many others were standing outside carrying palm leaves. As we passed through the desert, said one of them, we heard cries issuing from this tomb, and having entered, we found you lying unconscious on the floor. Doubtless the devils had thrown you down and had fled at our approach. Paphnutius, raising his head, asked in a feeble voice, Who are you, my brothers? And why do you carry palms in your hands? Is it for my burial? One of them replied, Brother, do you not know that our father Antony, now a hundred and five years old, having been warned of his approaching end, has come down from Mount Colzine, to which he had retired to bless his numerous spiritual children? We are going with palm leaves to greet our Holy Father. But how is it, brother, that you are ignorant of such a great event? Can it be possible that no angel came to this tomb to inform you? Alas, replied Paphnutius, I am not worthy of such a favor, and the only denizens of this abode are demons and vampires. Pray for me. I am Paphnutius, abbot of Antinoe the most wretched of the servants of God. At the name of Paphnutius, all waved their palm leaves and murmured his praises. The monk who had previously spoken cried in surprise, Can it be that thou art that holy Paphnutius, celebrated for so many works that it was supposed he would some day equal the great Antony himself? Most venerable, it was thou who convertedst to God the courtesan Thais, and who, raised upon a high column, was carried away by the seraphs. Those who watched by night at the foot of the pillar saw thy blessed assumption. The wings of the angels encircled thee in a white cloud, and with thy right hand extended thou didst bless the dwellings of men. The next day, when the people saw there wert no longer there, a long groan rose to the summit of the discrowned pillar. But Flavian, thy disciple, reported the miracle, and took thy place as the head. But a foolish man of the name of Paul tried to contradict the general opinion. He asserted that he had seen thee in a dream carried away by the devils. The people wanted to stone him, and it was a miracle that he escaped death. I am Zosimus, abbot of these solitary monks, whom thou seest prostrate at thy feet. Like them I kneel before thee, that thou mayest bless the Father with the children. Then thou shalt relate to us the marvels which God has deigned to accomplish by thy means." Far from having favored me as thou believest, replied Paphnutius, the Lord has tried me with terrible temptations. I was not carried away by angels, but a shadowy wall is raised in front of my eyes and moves before me. I have lived in a dream. Without God, all is a dream. When I made my journey to Alexandria, I heard in a short space of time many discourses, and I learned that the army of errors was innumerable. It pursues me, and I am compassed about with words. Zosimus replied, Venerable Father, we must remember that the saints, and especially the solitary saints, undergo terrible trials. If thou wast not carried to heaven by the seraphs, it is certain that the Lord granted that favor to thy image. For Flavian, the monks, and the people were witnesses of thy assumption. 
Paphnutius resolved to go and receive the blessing of Antony. Brother Zosimus, he said, give me one of these palm leaves and let us go and meet our father. Let us go, replied Zosimus. Military order is most befitting for monks who are God's soldiers. Thou and I, being abbots, will march in front, and the others shall follow us, singing psalms. They set out on their march, and Paphnutius said, God is unity, for he is the truth, which is one. The world is many, because it is error. We should turn away from all the sights of nature, even those which appear the most innocent. Their diversity renders them pleasant, which is a sign that they are evil. For that reason I cannot see a tuft of papyrus by the side of the still waters without my soul being imbued with melancholy. All things that the senses perceive are detestable. The least grain of sand brings danger. Everything tempts us. Woman is but a combination of all the temptations scattered in the thin air, on the flowering earth, in the clear waters. Happy is he whose soul is a sealed vase. Happy is he who knows how to be deaf, dumb, and blind, and who knows nothing of the world in order that he may know God. Zosimus, having meditated upon these words, replied as follows. Venerable Father, it is fitting that I should avow my sins to thee, since thou hast shown me thy soul. Thus we shall confess to each other, according to the apostolic custom. Before I was a monk, I led an abominable life. At Madaura, a city celebrated for its courtesans, I sought out all kinds of worldly love. Every night I supped in company with young debauchees, and I took home with me the one who pleased me best. A saint like thee could never imagine to what a pitch the fury of my desires carried me. Suffice it to say that it spared neither matrons nor nuns, and spread adultery and sacrilege everywhere. I excited my senses with wine, and was justly known as the heaviest drinker in Madaura. Yet I was a Christian, and in all my follies kept my faith in Jesus crucified. Having devoured my substance in riotous living, I was beginning to feel the first attacks of poverty when I saw one of my companions in pleasure suddenly struck with a terrible disease. His knees could not sustain him. His twitching hands refused to obey him. His glazed eyes closed. Only horrible groans came from his breast. His mind, heavier than his body, slumbered. To punish him for having lived like a beast, God had changed him into a beast. The loss of my property had already inspired me with salutary reflections, but the example of my friend was of a yet greater efficacy. It made such an impression on my heart that I quitted the world and retired into the desert. There I have enjoyed for twenty years a peace that nothing has troubled. I work with my monks as weaver, architect, carpenter, and even as scribe though, to say the truth, I have little taste for writing, having always preferred action to thought. My days are full of joy, and my nights without dreams, and I believe that the grace of the Lord is in me, because even in the midst of the most frightful sins, I have never lost hope. On hearing these words, Paphnutius lifted his eyes to heaven, and murmured, Lord, thou lookest with kindness upon this man, polluted by adultery, sacrilege, and so many crimes, and thou turnest away from me, who have always kept thy commandments, 
How inscrutable is thy justice, O my God, and how impenetrable are thy ways! Zosimus extended his arms. Look, venerable father, on both sides of the horizon are long black files that look like emigrant ants. They are our brothers, who, like us, are going to meet Antony. When they came to the place of the meeting, they saw a magnificent spectacle. The army of monks extended in three ranks, in an immense semicircle. In the first rank stood the old hermits of the desert, cross in hand, and with long beards that almost touched the ground. The monks, governed by the abbots Ephraim and Serapion, and also all the Cenobites of the Nile, formed the second line. Behind them appeared the ascetics, who had come from their distant rocks. Some wore on their blackened and dried-up bodies shapeless rags. Others had for their only clothes bundles of reeds held together by withies. Many of them were naked, but God had covered them with a fell of hair as thick as a sheep's fleece. All held branches of palm. They looked like an emerald rainbow. Or they might have been also compared to the host of the elect, the living walls of the city of God. Such perfect order reigned in the assembly that Paphnutius found, without difficulty, the monks he governed. He placed himself near them, and, having taken care to hide his face under his hood, that he might remain unknown and not disturb them in their pious expectation. Suddenly an immense shout arose. The saint! they all cried. The saint! Behold the great saint against whom hell has not prevailed, the well-beloved of God, our father, Antony. Then a great silence followed, and every forehead was lowered to the sand. From the summit of a dune, in the vast void space, Antony advanced, supported by his beloved disciples, Marcarius and Amathus. He walked slowly, but his figure was still upright and showed the remains of a superhuman strength. His white beard spread over his broad chest. His polished skull reflected the rays of the sunlight like the forehead of Moses. The keen gaze of the eagle was in his eyes. The smile of a child shone on his round cheek. To bless his people he raised his arms. Tired by a century of marvelous works, and his voice burst forth for the last time with the words of love. How goodly are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacles, O Israel! Immediately from one end to the other of the living wall, like a peal of harmonious thunder, the psalm, Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, broke forth. Accompanied by Marcarius and Amathus, Antony passed along the ranks of the old hermits, anchorites, and cenobites. This seer, who had beheld heaven and hell, this hermit, who from a cave in the rock governed the Christian church, this saint, who had sustained the faith of the martyrs, this scholar whose eloquence had paralyzed the heretics, spoke tenderly to each of his sons and bade them a kindly farewell on the eve of the blessed death which God, who loved him, had at last promised him. He said to the abbots Ephraim and Serapion, You command large armies, and you are both great generals. Therefore you shall put on in heaven an armor of gold, and the archangel Michael shall give you the title of Kiliarchs, of his hosts. Perceiving the old man, Philemon, he embraced him and said, Behold, the kindest and best of all my children. His soul exhales a perfume as sweet as the flower of the beans he sows every year. To Abbot Zosimus he addressed these words, Thou hast never mistrusted divine goodness, and therefore the peace of the Lord is in thee. 
the lily of thy virtues, has flowered upon the dunghill of thy corruption. To all he spoke words of unerring wisdom. To the old hermits, he said, the apostle saw around the throne of God eighty old men, seated, clad in white robes and wearing crowns on their heads. To the young men, be joyful, leave sadness to the happy ones of this world. Thus he passed along the front of his filial army, exhorting and comforting. Paphnutius, seeing him approach, fell on his knees, his heart torn by fear and hope. My father, my father, he cried in his agony, my father, come to my help, for I perish. I have given to God the soul of Thais, I have lived upon the top of a column, and in the chamber of a tomb, my forehead unceasingly in the dust has become horny as a camel's knee, and yet God has gone from me. Bless me, my father, and I shall be saved. Shake the hiss up, and I shall be washed, and I shall shine as the snow. Anthony did not reply. He turned to the monks of Antinoe, those eyes whose looks no man could sustain. He gazed for a long time at Paul, called the fool. Then he made a sign to him to approach. And as all were astonished that the saint who would address himself to a man who was not in his senses. Anthony said, God has granted to him more grace than to any of you. Lift thy eyes, my son Paul, and tell me what thou seest in heaven. Paul the fool raised his eyes, his face shone, and his tongue was unloosed. I, I see in heaven, he said, a bed adorned with hangings of purple and gold. Around it three virgins keep constant watch that no soul may approach it except the chosen one for whom the bed is prepared. Believing that this bed was the symbol of his glorification, Paphnutius had already begun to return thanks to God. But Antony made a sign to him to be silent and to listen to the fool who murmured in his ecstasy, the three virgins speak to me. They say to me, A saint is about to quit the earth. Thais of Alexandria is dying, and we have prepared the bed for her glory, for we are her virtues, faith, fear, and love. Antony asked, Sweet child, what else seest thou? Paul gazed vacantly from the zenith to the nadir, and from the west to the east, when suddenly his eyes fell on the abbot of Antinoe. His face grew pale with a holy terror, and his eyeballs reflected invisible flames. I see, he murmured, three demons, who, full of joy, prepare to seize that man. One of them is like unto a tower, one to a woman, and one to a mage. All three bear their name, marked with a red-hot iron, the first on the forehead, the second on the belly, the third on the breast, and those names are pride, lust, and doubt. I have finished. Having spoken thus, Paul, with haggard eyes and hanging jaw, returned to his old, simple ways. And, as the monks of Antinoe looked anxiously at Antony, the saint pronounced these words, God has made known his just judgment. Let us bow to him and hold our peace. He passed. He bestowed blessings as he went. The sun, now descended to the horizon, enveloped him in its glory, and his shadow, immeasurably elongated by a miracle from heaven, 
unrolled itself behind him like an endless carpet. As a sign of the long remembrance this great saint would leave amongst men. Upright, but thunderstruck, Paphnutius saw and heard nothing more. One word alone rang in his ears. Thais is dying. The thought had never occurred to him. Twenty years he had contemplated a mummy's head, and yet the idea that death would close the eyes of Thais astonished him hopelessly. Thais is dying, an incomprehensible saying. Thais is dying. In those three words, what a new and terrible sense. Thais is dying. Then why the sun, the flowers, the brooks, and all creation? Thais is dying. What good was all the universe? Suddenly he sprang forward to see her again, to see her once more. He began to run. He knew not where he was or whither he went, but instinct conducted him with unerring certainty. He went straight to the Nile. A swarm of sails covered the upper water of the river. He sprang on board a bark, manned by Nubians, and lying in the forepart of the boat, his eyes devouring space, he cried in grief and rage, Fool! Fool that I was! Not to have possessed Thais whilst there was yet time! Fool to have believed that there was anything else in the world but her! Oh, madness! I dreamed of God, of the salvation of my soul, of life eternal, as if all that counted for anything when I had seen Thais! Why did I not feel that blessed eternity was in a single kiss of that woman, and that without her life was senseless and no more than an evil dream? O oh, stupid fool! Thou hast seen her, and thou hast desired the good things of the other world. O oh, coward! Thou hast seen her, and thou hast feared God. God! Heaven! What are they? And what have they to offer thee which are worth the least tittle of that which she would have given thee? O oh, miserable, senseless fool, who sought divine goodness elsewhere than on the lips of Thais! What hand was upon thy eyes? Cursed be he who blinded thee then! Thou couldst have bought, at the price of thy damnation, one moment of her love, and thou hast not done it. She opened to thee her arms, flesh mingled with the perfume of flowers, and thou wast not engulfed in the unspeakable enchantments of her unveiled breast. Thou hast listened to the jealous voice which said to thee, Refrain, dupe, dupe, miserable dupe. O oh, regrets, O oh, remorse, O oh, despair, not to have the joy to carry to hell the memory of that never-to-be-forgotten hour and to cry to God, Burn my flesh, dry up all the blood in my veins, break all my bones, thou canst not take from me the remembrance which sweetens and refreshes me for ever and ever. Thais is dying. Preposterous God, if thou knewest how I laugh at thy hell, Thais is dying, and she will never be mine. Never, never. And as the boat came down the river with the current, he remained whole days lying on his face and repeating, Never, never, never. Then, at the idea that she had given herself to others and not to him, that she had poured forth an ocean of love, and he had not wetted his lips therein. He stood up, savagely wild, and howled with grief. He tore his breast with his nails, and bit the flesh of his arms. He thought, if I could but kill all those she has loved. The idea of these murders filled him with delicious fury. He dreamed of killing Nicias slowly and leisurely, looking him full in the eyes whilst he murdered him. 
Then suddenly his fury melted away. He wept. He sobbed. He became feeble and meek. An unknown tenderness softened his soul. He longed to throw his arms round the neck of the companion of his childhood and say to him, Nicias, I love thee, because thou hast loved her. Talk to me about her. Tell me what she said to thee. And still, without ceasing, the iron of that phrase entered into his soul. Thais is dying. Light of day, silvery shadow of night stars, heavens, trees with trembling crests, savage beasts, domestic animals, all the anxious souls of men, do you not hear? Thais is dying. Disappear, ye lights, breezes, and perfumes. Hide yourselves, ye shapes and thoughts of the universe. Thais is dying. She was the beauty of the world, and all that drew near to her grew fairer in the reflection of her grace. The old man and the sages who sat near her at the banquet at Alexandria, how pleasant they were, and how fascinating was their conversation. A host of brilliant thoughts sprang to their lips, and all their ideas were steeped in pleasure. And it was because the breath of Thais was on them that all they said was love, beauty, truth. A delightful impiety lent its grace to their discourse. They thoroughly expressed all human splendor. Alas, all that is but a dream. Thais is dying. Oh, how easy it will be to me to die of her death. But canst thou only die, withered embryo, fetus steeped in gall and scalding tears? Miserable abortion, dost thou think thou canst taste death, thou who hast never known life? If only God exists, that he may damn me. I hope for it. I wish for it. God, I hate thee. Dost thou hear? Overwhelm me with thy damnation. To compel thee to, I spit in thy face. I must find an eternal hell to exhaust the eternity of rage which consumes me. The next day, at dawn, Albina received the abbot of Antinoe at the nunnery. Thou art welcome to our tabernacles of peace, venerable father, for no doubt thou comest to bless the saint thou hast given us. Thou knowest that God, in his mercy, has called her to him. How couldst thou fail to know tidings that the angels have carried from desert to desert? It is true that Thais is about to meet her blessed death. Her labors are accomplished. And I ought to inform thee in a few words as to her conduct, whilst she was still among us. After thy departure, when she was confined in a cell sealed with thy seal, I sent her, with her food, a flute, similar to those which girls of her profession play at banquets. I did that to prevent her from falling into a melancholy mood, and that she should not show less skill and talent before God than she had shown before men. In this I showed prudence and foresight, for all day long Thais praised the Lord upon the flute, and the virgins, who were attracted by the sound of this invisible flute, said, We hear the nightingale of the heavenly groves, the dying swan of Jesus crucified. Thus did Thais perform her penance, when, after sixty days, the door which thou hadst sealed opened of itself, and the clay seal was broken without being touched by any human hand. By that sign I knew that the trial thou hadst imposed upon her was at an end, and that God had pardoned the sins of the flute player. From that time she has shared the ordinary life of my nuns, working and praying with them. 
She was an example to them by the modesty of her acts and words, and seemed like a statue of purity among them. Sometimes she was sad, but those clouds soon passed. When I saw that she was really drawn towards God by faith, hope, and love, I did not hesitate to employ her talent, and even her beauty, for the improvement of her sisters. I asked her to represent before us the actions of the famous women and wise virgins of the scriptures. She acted Esther, Deborah, Judith, Mary, the sister of Lazarus, and Mary, the mother of Jesus. Oh, I know, venerable father, that thy austere mind is alarmed at the idea of these performances, but thou thyself wouldst have been touched if thou hadst seen her in these pious scenes, shedding real tears, and raising to heaven arms graceful as palm leaves. I have long governed a community of women, and I make it a rule never to oppose their nature. All seeds give not the same flowers. Not all souls are sanctified in the same way. It must also not be forgotten that Thais gave herself to God, whilst she was still beautiful, and such a sacrifice is, if not unexampled, at least very rare. This beauty, her natural vesture, has not left her during the three months' fever of which she is dying. As during her illness she has incessantly asked to see the sky, I have her carried every morning into the courtyard, near the well, under the old fig tree, in the shade of which the abbesses of this convent are accustomed to hold their meetings. Thou wilt find her there, venerable father, but hasten, for God calls her, and this night a shroud will cover that face which God made both to shame and to edify this world. Paphnutius followed her into a courtyard flooded with the morning light. On the edge of the brick roofs, the pigeons formed a string of pearls. On a bed, in the shade of the fig tree, Thais lay, quite white, her arms crossed. By her side stood veiled women, reciting the prayers for the dying. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. He called her. Thais. She raised her eyelids and turned the whites of her eyes in the direction of the voice. Albina made a sign to the veiled women to retire a few paces. Thais, repeated the monk. She raised her head. A light breath came from her pale lips. Is it thou, my father? Dost thou remember the water of the spring and the dates that we picked? That day, my father, love was born in my heart, the love of life eternal. She was silent, and her head fell back. Death was upon her, and the sweat of the last agony bedewed her forehead. A pigeon broke the still silence with its plaintive cooing. Then the sobs of the monk mingled with the psalms of the virgins. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Suddenly Thais sat up in the bed, her violet eyes open wide, and with a rapt gaze, her arm stretched toward the distant hills, she said in a clear, fresh voice, Behold them, the roses of the eternal dawn. Her eyes shone, a slight flush suffused her face, she had revived, more sweet and more beautiful than ever. Paphnutius knelt down and threw his long black arms around her. Do not die, he cried in a strange voice, which he himself did not recognize. I love thee. Do not die. Listen, my Thais, I have deceived thee. I was but a wretched fool. God, heaven, all that, it's nothing. 
There is nothing true but this worldly life and the love of human beings. I love thee. Do not die. That would be impossible. Thou art too precious. Come, come with me. Let us fly. I will carry thee far away in my arms. Come, let us love. Hear me, O oh my beloved, and say, I will live. I wish to live. Thais, Thais, arise. She did not hear him. Her eyes gazed into infinity. She murmured, Heaven opens. I see the angels, the prophets, and the saints. The good Theodore is amongst them. His hands filled with flowers. He smiles on me and calls me. Two angels come to me. They draw near. How beautiful they are. I see God. She uttered a joyful sigh, and her head fell back motionless on the pillow. Thais was dead. Paphnutius held her in a last despairing embrace. His eyes devoured her with desire, rage, and love. Albina cried to him, Avaunt, accursed wretch! And she gently placed her fingers on the eyelids of the dead girl. Paphnutius staggered back, his eyes burning with flames and feeling the earth open beneath his feet. The virgins chanted the song of Zacharias, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. Suddenly their voices stayed in their throats. They had seen the monk's face, and they fled in a fright, crying, A vampire! A vampire! He had become so repulsive that passing his hand over his face, he felt his own hideousness. End of Thais by Anatole France